the uh, John Adams Institute, uh, the main thing that we do is bring great American authors to speak in the Netherlands, and tonight is a stellar example of that. Uh, James Glick has been a hero of mine since Chaos uh, was published in, I think, 1988. Am I right? 87. 87. Um, and I was talking to my parents last night and told them who we had here tonight, and my father reminded me that I gave him uh, Chaos as a Christmas present that, that year, and uh, he reminded me that it is one of his five favorite books. So my father wishes he were here, Jim. Um, we, uh, James Glick will talk for a bit. There will be a moderated discussion, and uh, then uh, the floor will be open to questions, and then he'll sign books. Our moderator is well known to many of you. Tracy Metz is a journalist for the NRC Handelsblatt. She is an author on urban and spatial issues. In 2007, she was named to be a member of the Delta Commission, installed by the Dutch cabinet to advise the government on water issues. She has been the author or co-author of a number of books, including Fun, Leisure, and Landscape, about how our fun influences our surroundings. In February, her, her new book will appear, Sweet and Salt, Water and the Dutch, about the extreme makeover of the Dutch landscape in order to accommodate a new relationship to water. Please welcome our moderator, Tracy Metz. Good evening to you all. Thank you, Russell, for the warm introduction and a special welcome to our wonderful stellar guest of the evening, Jim Glick. Jim's new book, the one he's here to talk about tonight, is called The Information, A Theory, A History, A Flood. It is his newest major achievement as a Harvard-educated journalist, writing for the New York Times, and now as an independent author about science. He previously wrote books that also had wonderful titles, such as Faster, the acceleration of just about everything, chaos, and genius. I wish my books had great titles like this. Three of his books have been finalists for the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, and they have been translated into more than 20 languages. His new book, The Information, has appeared in translation with the Bezig Bay, and simultaneously in German, and also in the other remaining 18 languages. Well, speaking of the title, the first and last words of the title of this new book have stayed with me ever since I knew that we would be meeting this evening, nagging away in a corner of my brain. The information? Why the definite article? Among the many things this book conveys, one concept truly stands out, the very magnitude of the information. In his book, Glick makes his way gracefully through time, from the spoken word to the written word, to the first dictionary, to the concept of alphabetical order, to the telegraph, to the telephone, to the difference engine, I won't tell you more about that, to the throwback, which computed arithmetic with Roman numerals, to the computing machine, to the laptop, to the mini computers that we all have in our pockets or handbags. And the amount of information and the amount of access we have to information just keeps multiplying exponentially, like the bread and the fishes of the Bible. Information is everywhere. The world is made of information, and really always has been, even when we didn't know to call it that. Information, Glick says, is the modern era's defining quality. How, then, can he speak of the information as if there are only one, the universe? I'll ask him later. And then the flood. Yes, I'm sure we all recognize that. Sometimes we feel we're drowning in all the information available to us, yet it is never enough. We are all information junkies. We always want more, but when we get it, we complain of information fatigue or information overload. I guess it's a little bit like reading Enerse Hondelsblatt's or like the New York Times. As readers, we want to have it all. We want a nice, fat, juicy newspaper and then we complain that we don't have time to read it, so we cancel our subscription. Our relationship to information nowadays, you could say, bears all the marks of a bad marriage. We can't do with, and we can't do without. 
Maybe what we really crave is not so much information as knowledge, insight. We need information in order to develop knowledge. Yet at the same time, knowledge and its companion, attention, are trees we easily overlook in the forest of information. Maybe now that we have more information at our fingertips than we can possibly ever consume, what we need are not the flood, the floodgates. Now that facts and data are everywhere, information now is really about information management, about picking and choosing and wayfinding. Information management can also be about power, about access to information, and about who filters information before it reaches us, and therefore about the flip side, privacy, profit, and censorship. We'll talk about that too. On a final note, this is a rich, wide-ranging, monumental book. Jim Glick takes us on a journey through five millennia, through the history of information, and now we have passed information on from one person to the next through the ages. It is an old story, and indeed, one of his tenets is that the information age has been around for much longer than we think. The history of information is actually a history of mankind. Jim, please tell us more. Well, thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Russell, for having me here. Thank you all for coming. Um, now I'm really looking forward to my conversation with Tracy. I think I will interview her. And I appreciate the very kind words. And, but before we do that, I'll, I'll try to, let me try to give you a little taste of my book. I start at a very specific time and place. It's true that... Um, as Tracy said, we, f we feel we're living in the information age, and it's already a cliché that this is the information age. And in a sense, the information age begins in 1948. As it happened, 1948 was when the Bell Telephone Laboratories announced the invention of an amazingly simple device that could do anything a vacuum tube could do and more. It was a tiny electronic semiconductor, a crystalline sliver so small that a hundred would fit in the palm of a hand. Uh, in May, scientists formed a committee to come up with a name, and the committee passed out paper ballots to senior engineers in Murray Hill, New Jersey, and uh, they listed uh, choices, semiconductor triode, iototron, then someone mashed up transconductance and varistor, and got the word transistor. And that, of course, that was the winner. Bell Labs put out a press release saying it may have far-reaching significance in electronics and electrical communication. And for once, the reality surpassed the hype. The transistor put electronics on its path of miniaturization and ubiquity and soon won the Nobel Prize for its three inventors. For the laboratory, it was the jewel in the crown. But it was only the second most significant development of that year. The transistor was only hardware, an invention more profound and more fundamental came in a monograph spread across 79 pages of the Bell System Technical Journal in July and October. No one bothered with a press release. It carried a title, both simple and grand, a mathematical theory of communication. And the message was hard to summarize, but it was a fulcrum around which the world began to turn. Like the transistor, this development also involved a neologism, the word bit, chosen in this case not by committee, but by the lone author, a 32-year-old named Claude Shannon. The bit now joined the inch, the pound, the quart, and the minute as a determinate quantity, a fundamental unit of measure. 
but measuring what? A unit for measuring information, Shannon wrote, as though there were such a thing measurable and quantifiable as information. People considered him a smart young man. He was from the rural Midwest, northern Michigan. He came east to go to MIT, and soon after graduating, he plunged into the laboratory's war work, first developing an automatic fire control director for anti-aircraft guns, then focusing on the theoretical underpinnings of secret communication, cryptography, and working out a mathematical proof of the security of the so-called X system, the telephone hotline between Churchill and Roosevelt. Shannon supposedly belonged to the Bell Labs Mathematical Research Group, but mostly he kept to himself. After the war, when the group left the New York headquarters for shiny new space in the New Jersey suburbs, he stayed behind, haunting a cubby hole in the old building a 12-story sandy brick hulk with its back to the Hudson River. He disliked commuting, and he liked Greenwich Village, where he could hear jazz clarinetists in late-night clubs. And he was flirting with a young woman who worked in Bell Labs' microwave research group in a two-story former Nabisco factory across the street. Anyway, his managers were willing to let him alone even though they didn't understand exactly what he was working on. Shannon, himself as a student, had never been quite able to decide whether to become an engineer or a mathematician. For Bell Labs, he was both practical about circuits and relays, but most at home in a mental world, fascinated by layers of symbolic abstraction He liked games and puzzles and secret codes. As a first-year researcher at MIT, he worked on a 100-ton proto-computer, Vannevar Bush's differential analyzer, which could solve equations with great rotating gears, shafts, and wheels. At 22, he wrote a dissertation that applied a 19th-century idea, George Boole's Algebra of Logic, to the design of electrical circuits, logic and electricity, peculiar combination. In 1943, the English mathematician and codebreaker Alan Turing visited Bell Labs on a secret cryptographic mission and met Shannon sometimes over lunch, where they traded speculation on the future of artificial thinking machines. Shannon uh, Turing reported to a friend, Shannon wants to feed not just data to a brain, but cultural things. He wants to play music to it. Shannon also crossed paths with Norbert Wiener, who had taught him at MIT, and by 1948 was proposing a new discipline to be called cybernetics, the study of communication and control. Meanwhile, Shannon began paying special attention to television signals from a peculiar point of view, wondering whether their content could be somehow compacted or compressed to allow for faster transmission. Logic and circuits crossbred to make a new hybrid thing. In his solitary way, seeking a framework to connect his many threads, Shannon began assembling a theory for information. He didn't call it that at first. He wrote to a former professor, off and on, I have been working on an analysis of some of the fundamental properties of general systems for the transmission of intelligence. Intelligence was a flexible term, very old. In the 16th century, Thomas Eliot wrote that intelligence was an elegant word used where there is mutual treaties or appointments either by letters or message, which suddenly sounds rather modern. By the 20th century, though, the word intelligence mostly meant something else. A few engineers, especially in the telephone labs, began speaking of information, 
They used the word in a way suggesting something technical. For the purposes of science, information had to mean something special. It had to be made mathematical and exact. Isaac Newton had done that with words like motion and force, ancient vague words that, under, that he gave new meanings. In the 19th century, the word energy was transformed in the same way. Energy meant something like vigor or intensity. Natural philosophers hijacked the word and gave energy its fundamental place in the physicist's view of nature. Now, in the mid 20th century, it was the same with information. A right of purification became necessary. And then, when it was made simple, distilled, counted in bits, information was found to be everywhere. Shannon's theory linked information to uncertainty, to entropy, and to chaos. It made a foundation for our world, leading to compact disks and fax machines, computers and cyberspace, Moore's Law, and all the world's silicon alleys, information processing was born. People began to name a successor to the Iron Age and the Steam Age. In 1967, Marshall McLuhan remarked, man the food gatherer reappears incongruously as information gatherer. He wrote this an instant too soon in the first dawn of computation and cyberspace. Information now pervades the sciences from top to bottom, transforming every branch of knowledge. Even biology has become an information science, a subject of messages, instructions, and code. Genes encapsulate information and enable procedures for reading it in and writing it out. Life spreads by networking. The body itself is an information processor, storing its, it, its data not just in brains but in every cell. No wonder genetics bloomed along with information theory. DNA is the quintessential information molecule, an alphabet and a code, six billion bits to form a human being. Richard Dawkins declares, what lies at the heart of every living thing is not a fire, not warm breath, not a spark of life. It is information, words, instructions. If you want to understand life, don't think about vibrant, throbbing gels and oozes. Think about information technology. Evolution itself embodies an ongoing exchange of information between organism and environment. Werner Lowenstein, after 30 years spent studying intercellular communication, declares the information circle becomes the unit of life. He reminds us that information means something deeper now. It connotes a cosmic principle of organization and order, and it provides an exact measure of that. Then, as the role of information grows beyond anyone's reckoning, it grows to be too much. TMI, people now say. We have information fatigue, anxiety, and glut. We've met the devil of information overload and his impish underlings, the computer virus, the busy signal, the dead link, and the PowerPoint presentation. As of 50 years ago, Marshall McLuhan considered us citizens of the electric age. He said, we are today as far into the electric age as the Elizabethans had advanced into the typographic and mechanical age, and we are experiencing the same confusions and indecisions which they felt when living simultaneously in two contrasted forms of society and experience. But his electric age had no email, no web surfing, 
not even cell phones, much less Facebook and Twitter. McLuhan was mainly watching television. We don't call it the electric age anymore. But McLuhan was right. We are still experiencing confusions and indecisions, maybe more now than ever. There's a universally recognized metaphor for our current predicament, the word flood. There's a sensation of drowning, of information as a rising, churning deluge. Data wash over us from above and below. One may lose the ability to impose order on the chaos of sensations. Truth seems hard to find among a multitude of plausible fictions. David Foster Wallace, not long before he died, complained about the tsunami of available fact, context, and perspective. So to help us cope, we have Google and Yahoo and Wikipedia, and we generate a lot of unintended irony. We write astounding numbers of new books each year about information glut. Amazon.com transmits messages like, start reading data smog on your Kindle in under a minute. And surprise me, see a random page in this book. Just 20 years ago, when the internet was a gleam on the horizon, the philosopher Daniel Dennett speculated about how electronic networks might upend the economics of publishing, of all things, poetry. Imagine, he said, what if instead of slim books, elegant specialty items marketed to connoisseurs, poets could publish online. They might reach not hundreds, but millions of readers almost instantly, not for tens of dollars, but maybe for fractions of pennies. That same year, in 1990, the publisher Charles Chadwick Healy, walking one day through the British Library, conceived of what he called the English Poetry Full Text Database. And four years later, he had produced it, not online, but in four compact discs, 165,000 poems by 1,250 poets spanning 13 centuries, priced at $51,000. Readers and critics had to figure out what to make of this. Not read it, surely, the way you would read a book. Read in it, perhaps, or search it for half-remembered fragments. Anthony Lane reviewed the database for the New Yorker magazine and described the experience this way. You hunch like a pianist over the keys, knowing what awaits you, thinking, ah, the untold wealth of English literature, what hidden jewels I shall excavate from the deepest minds of human fancy. It quickly transpires that the jewels are outnumbered by the clunkers. The flood of bombast and mediocrity, the sheer unordered mass can wear you down. Not that Lane sounds at all weary. What a steaming heap, he cries. Never have I beheld such a magnificent tribute to the powers of human incompetence and also, by the same token, to the blessings of human forgetfulness. <laughs> he cites, by way of example, a funny self-referential couplet by the utterly forgotten Thomas Freeman, circa 1610. Whoop, whoop, methinks I hear my reader cry, here is rhyme doggerel, I confess it, I. And by the way, after Lane quoted this in The New Yorker, Freeman finally got an entry in Wikipedia. The CD-ROMs are already obsolete. All poetry is in the network now, or if not all, some approximation thereof, and if not now, then soon, and not just the poetry. 
the information produced and consumed by humankind used to vanish. That was the norm, the default. The sights, the sounds, the songs, the spoken word just melted away. Marks on stone, parchment, and paper were the special case. It didn't occur to Sophocles' audiences that it would be a tragedy for his plays to be lost. They just enjoyed the show. Now expectations have inverted. Everything may be recorded and preserved. At least potentially, every musical performance, every football game, every crime in a shop, elevator, or city street, every volcano or tsunami on the remotest shore. Having a camera at hand is normal, not exceptional. Something like 500 billion images were captured last year. YouTube streams more than 2 billion videos per day. I could give you a statistic for Twitter, too, but it would be obsolete before we leave the room. All this is due, in its roundabout way, to Shannon. One day in the summer of 1949, Shannon took a pencil and a piece of notebook paper, drew a line from top to bottom, wrote the powers of 10, from 10 to the zeroth to 10 to the 13th, He labeled this axis bits storage capacity. He began listing some items that might be said to store information. A digit wheel in a desktop adding machine represented just over three bits. At 10 to the fourth, 10,000 bits, he put page single-spaced typing 32 possible symbols. Near 10 to the fifth, He wrote something offbeat, genetic constitution of man. This was 1949. There was no real precedent for this in current scientific thinking. James Watson was a 21-year-old student of zoology in Indiana. Francis Crick had just switched from physics into biology. I think Shannon's doodling was the first time anyone suggested the genome was an information store measurable in bits. His guess was off by at least four orders of magnitude. He thought a phono record, 128 levels, held more information, about 300,000 bits. At the one billion level, he put the Encyclopedia Britannica. He estimated one hour of Technicolor movie at 10 to the 12th, and then finally, just under his pencil mark for 10 to the 14th, that is 100 trillion bits, he put the largest information stockpile he could think of, the U.S. Library of Congress. That doesn't seem so big to us now. I started by saying that 1948 marked the beginning of the information age, but of course that's not exactly right. It would be better to say that that was when we began to see that all human history has been the information age. In the beginning was the word, according to John. The philosopher Fred Dretzky in 1981 offered an amendment. In the beginning was information. The word came later. We are the species that named itself Homo sapiens, the one who knows, and then after reflection amended that to Homo sapiens sapiens. The greatest gift of Prometheus to humanity was not fire, after all. He boasted, numbers two, chiefest of sciences, I invented for them, and the combining of letters, creative mother of the muses' arts, with which to hold all things in memory. We can appreciate that the alphabet was a founding technology of information that the telephone, the fax machine, the calculator, and ultimately the computer are only the latest innovations in a long sequence. Our furniture includes plasma displays and pocket devices. Our skills include texting and Googling. We are endowed. We are expert. So we see information in the foreground. 
but it has always been there. It pervaded our ancestors' world, too, taking forms from solid to ethereal, old granite gravestones and the whispers of courtiers, the punched card, the cash register, the 19th century difference engine, the wires of telegraphy all played their parts in weaving the spider web of information to which we cling. Hardly any information technology goes obsolete. Each new one throws its predecessors into relief. Thus, Thomas Hobbes, in the 17th century, resisted his era's new media hype. The invention of printing, though ingenious, compared with the invention of letters is no great matter. And up to a point, he was right. Every new medium transforms the nature of human thought. As for Claude Shannon, he died in 2001 without ever having become what you'd call a household name. He wasn't one for making grand predictions about the future. Once in the 1950s, he went out on a limb and said, I think that this present century, in a sense, will see a great upsurge and development of this whole information business, the business of collecting information and the business of transmitting it from one point to another, and perhaps most important of all, the business of processing it. Well, that happened. And after he died, one of Shannon's Bell Labs contemporaries mused, it's hard to picture the world before Shannon as it seemed to those who lived in it. It's difficult to recover innocence, ignorance, and lack of understanding. Tracy, you want to have a conversation? Thank you. What a wonderful talk, Jim. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, I've given away my first question. Oh, already. don't ask don't ask me that. Didn't I haven't I answered that question already? Didn't I just answer she's about to ask me why the information? All right, skip that one? Yeah. All right. Because um, I don't because I don't know. <laughs> just sounded right. And in Dutch, it's without the V. Yes. Yes. And why is that? Do you know that? Well, let's ask Flore. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us later. Why no V? <coughs> Tell okay. us later. Okay, we'll skip that, Jim, just to do you a favor. Um, I do have another question, though. Uh, given the uh, digitalization of everything, the Internet of Things, you still chose to make something in a quaint, old-fashioned format like a book. So that means that you still have deep trust in the medium of print and books. What's your feeling about this, 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 this object, this thing, that you can put in your bag and take with you wherever you go? Well, of course it might have meant that it's all I know how to do. But it's true, I do still, I do still have faith right or wrong in I, now I want to hold it hold up it. you know I do I do have a lot of faith in in the medium I mean I I don't necessarily I don't know if books will always be physical objects that look like this I think they will I mean I I, I still believe that there is something kind of perfect about this about this technology um and yet, a few years ago, I might have said that about newspapers. And I have to admit that these days, I'm more likely to read my newspaper online than I am to read it on paper. Now, it's still a newspaper. I still love it. I'm still a loyal reader of my hometown paper, the New York Times. And um, I pray that they're going to survive the transition. And I also pray that books are going to survive the transition because... Um, in part, of course, it's not just a question about the physical format. It's a question about whether people will continue to need to read things that are 100,000 words long 
when all of us, I'm no exception, spend a lot of, t- a lot of the day reading things in very short chunks. I was very depressed when I heard someone at the Washington Post call their longer pieces thumb suckers. Well, that's, but that's an old word. Oh. That's a, I mean, <laughs> when I first got into the newspaper business, that was, already a, that was already what they called. So we don't have to feel bad about that. Oh, that sounds like something very much on its way out. Actually, I think it's a pejorative term for a certain kind of analytical piece without content. Any, any other old-time journalists here who can shed light on thumb suckers? <laughs> uh, Russell, is, Russell is nodding. Okay. So, okay, so there's one, one piece of bad news you can cross off your list. Good. Glad to hear it, because as, since we are both uh, you formerly and me presently newspaper people, uh, I think the, the format in which we consume our information is still also very relevant. Well, th- yes. There are a lot of institutions that are making a difficult transition, right? Um, en- encyclopedias. Encyclopedias are gone, in a way. Mm. I- I- I'm sorry. I'm sorry if there are publishers who have printed encyclopedias in the, in the room. You mean um, printed encyclopedias? Printed en- Well, it's not clear is it whether any of the great institutions, encyclopedic institutions, will successfully make the transition. All right, an example of an institution that I believe has already made the transition, I don't know if it will make money for them, the Oxford English Dictionary, the biggest dictionary in the world in any language. The last edition they published in, I think, 1989 was 20-something thick volumes. I don't believe there will ever again be a paper edition of the OED. No. They haven't announced one way or the other. They continue to function, and, and you can read the third edition online. It's an online thing, and it's great. I mean, it's, they have made, a, they've made something better than the paper product. Um, they have really used the new medium. And um, there's no reason to think that newspapers can't do that. Some news, your newspaper already is, right? Weren't you in charge of that? Yes, yes. No, <laughs> no I wasn't. Uh, but of course, the difference is, are people willing to pay for something uh, online that they were willing to pay for in print? It's, it's more a mental issue than the actual right. information or the <coughs> vehicle that, that bears the information. It, that well, brings exactly. me to a, to a question. And that's that, why I called it the information. Aha. To make it clear that the information itself is Substantial is, a, is a, a thing, a yeah. huge, huge thing. Yeah, I was has substance. Um, reading the book, and you see already in our conversation the extent to which information and the technology that is the bearer of the information almost become synonymous, or at least the terminology gets all mixed up. So, I was wondering, could you tell me something about the difference? of the history of information, which is what your book, at least nominally, is about, and the history of technology. They're so closely intertwined. Well, that's, that's an interesting way to put it. It's true that there is a tendency, there always has been and there still is, to confuse, well, to quote Marshall McLuhan again, the medium and the message. I mean, that McLuhan called his book the medium is the message, knowing that that's not true. I, I mean, it's not true. And, and he knew that. He was trying to make a point. He was trying to say that the media in which information is carried can be just as important, can have just as much an effect on us as the message itself. We can mix up you know, is this a book, the physical object, or is the content of it, the information, the book? And in that case, I can beam the book to you in nanoseconds, right? Well, one nanosecond, two nanoseconds. Um, That's the speed of light. A digression, an anecdote on the the topic of your question. Um, This is from the telegraph era, This is a story that people tell. It's apparently a true story that illustrates how confusing new media can be. 
um, for everybody. I, and the story, the story is a woman walks into a telegraph office in Maine in the United States with a, a message and hands it to the telegraph operator. And the telegraph o- operator sends the message and then spikes the piece of paper on a hook. And she says, well, so aren't you going to send it? And he says, but I did send it. And she said, no, you didn't. I see it right there. How sweet. Well, so which is the message? She still thought it was the piece of paper. This is, um, it has been difficult for us humans to come to grips with these new abstractions, with these concepts of information. As I said, we're all very sophisticated about it now. We're really experts, and it's worth remembering that we had to learn this, that the message is different from the medium. A digression on my side then, Jim. Why is it that there are newspapers called the Daily Telegraph, but there was never a newspaper called the Daily Telephone? Isn't, isn't that great? Why and, is that? And I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to that question. Oh, really? I'm so glad. I've, I've, it never occurred to me until I read the book. And then I thought, hey, but that was at least as huge an intervention in human life as the telegraph. That's true. Okay, this is my proposed answer. And I can't swear this is true, so you know, choose to believe me or not. But um, when the telegraph arrived... One of the things people predicted, by the way, was that the telegraph would cause the demise of newspapers. Um, People thought, who needs to buy this big thing giving me yesterday's news when the telegraph is transmitting the news instantaneously? Um, The newspapers, however, became quick early adopters of the telegraph. They were the first people to use it, right? I mean, a reporter could now be in a place far away from the home office and send his dispatch by wire. And it very quickly became a matter of prestige for a newspaper to be able to say in a slug line of some kind, story dispatched by telegraph, right? And so that's why I think the telegraph was in that era a sexy sounding name for a newspaper. Um, nothing like that happened with the telephone. It wasn't, I mean, they did, of course, newspaper reporters still use telephones just as much, but it, there wasn't the cachet. It didn't sell papers to be able to say, it wasn't that much of a speed advance over the telegraph. So that's my guess. <laughs> Take it or leave it. So would we now, I don't think we'd now have an, if anybody were starting a newspaper now, we wouldn't have any newspapers called the uh, internet, the daily, the daily Twitter, or the daily internet. I don't think no, the daily it's... Twitter is going to fly as a newspaper <laughs> name. As you said, anything on Twitter would be dated <laughs> by the time we left the room. I was uh, uh, fascinated by the main figure of your narrative, uh, Claude Shannon. What an uh, what an amazing mind this man must have had. But he also worked together with someone uh, who also had a, a fascinating but tragic life, uh, Turing. Could you tell us something about their relationship? They met in 1943, and it turned out that they had a lot in common. Yeah. But Shannon seemed to go on and and take flight, even though he didn't become a household name. But Turing um, didn't do well in life. What happened to him? Well, I think many people here know know quite a bit about Alan Turing. He was a great English mathematician, um, Somewhat older than Shannon, I think. Maybe not much. Maybe not much older. A pure mathematician who, um, in a way, invented computing. I mean, other people have invented computing. And my book has quite a bit about Charles Babbage, mm-hmm. who actually built and tried to build a, a sort of mechanical computing machine. What Alan Turing did was, in his mind's eye, in invent for philosophical purposes, for mathematical purposes, a a very simple kind of computer that was just, um, think of it as the head of a tape recorder that would march back and forth across a paper tape writing and reading ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. Um, Then, in the midst of this brilliant and still extremely influential mathematical work, he was recruited to work on his country's most important secret project, which was the code-breaking work at Mm -hmm. Bletchley Park in England during World War II. And it was um, 
while he was working on or just after he worked on this project that he met Claude Shannon, as I said, at Bell Labs, he was sent across the ocean during the war on this secret mission to do with cryptography. And Shannon was also working on cryptography for Bell Labs. And they met over lunch, but they could not talk, they never talked about their work because neither of them was cleared to hear about the other's secret work. <laughs> Here are these two brilliant minds at one table. And right. And they, they never met again because oh. then Turing returned to England. And, and as you have suggested, he died an, an early tragic death after being arrested by the British police for the crime of homosexuality and essentially tortured. I mean, they, they thought, uh, um, I don't know how they felt it in the Netherlands at the time, but in England at the time, they felt that homosexuality was a disease that could perhaps be cured with injections of estrogen. And um, Turing was depressed and he committed suicide in, mm -hmm. in the early 50s. So not long after the, the really the... Not long after he had performed heroic service yeah. for his country during the war. I mean, not that... Terrible. Not that that makes it any more tragic, yeah. but uh, yeah. sad story. I was struck during your talk about the... Uh, especially in this uh, age of the information age right around the Second World War and then the Cold War that ensued. Um, we were born in the same year, so... You probably also learned that you had to hide from the Russians under your bed? Not under my bed, but under, my, under the desk at school. No, and no, not... the desk at school? That was in case there was an atomic bomb attack. Right. Oh, no, I never hid from the Russians under my bed. Okay, well, I had to hide from the Russians under my bed, and then under my desk if there was an atom bomb. Nice atomic childhood. Bomb. Yeah, well, that's the Cold <laughs> War in the U.S., let me tell you. <laughs> and I was struck by, um, first of all, also in your talk, you mentioned the, the, all this cloak and dagger business of the... the uh, Intelligence. It was really more the intelligence age than the information age, given mm -hmm. the, the fraught circumstances around the Second World War. And also the fear people had then of um, thinking machines. There's a wonderful quote in your book about, uh, I'm afraid it escapes me who said it, but that uh, uh, these thinking machines would devalue the human brain. And these are all fears that to me are so much part of the, the whole Cold War xenophobia and paranoia. Is there a, a, a cultural historic dimension to this well, that's, development? That's in an the, interesting idea. Is it? I don't oh. know. I don't know whether that's true. I mean, I wonder. Did I how, just make this up? Well, I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, I wonder how many people in the audience still have fear. Might not fear might be too strong a word. Have concerns about no fear isn't too strong a word. Have a fear of thinking machines taking over. Aren't people still worried about that? Um, the so-called, yeah, there's a, here are hands already. P people talk about the, um, you know, the, what do you call it, the singularity. Yes. Um, I'm not, I don't know whether it was because of the fears of atomic destruction that people were also worried about the idea of thinking machines. Now, it happens that both Shannon and Turing, I mean, this is, this is what they did talk about, over, over lunch or over tea, instead of talking about cryptography, they did talk about thinking machines. And Turing, in particular, is, is famous again. This is, maybe he's even more famous for this in some circles, for his, what's called the Turing test. His, this is his answer to the question, how would we know if a machine was truly intelligent, if a machine was really thinking? You know, at this time, Computers could hardly do anything, and, and people thought... And they were huge. And they were huge. They were huge. People thought of, if, a, if a computing machine could ever play chess, that would be amazing. Both Shannon and Turing thought, about, thought a lot about computer chess. Yep. But Turing had this idea um, that if you could have a machine in one room and a human in the other room and have a teletype connection to the two rooms, and you were allowed to ask... I know many people in the audience know this. If you're allowed to ask questions of, of both of them, mm -hmm. if the machine could fool you into thinking it was human, not having to give truthful answers, then you'd have to admit that you had a, a thinking machine. You know, the machine would be allowed... If you ask the machine, what's 123 times 4,576, the machine would be allowed to say, 
Oh gosh, I've never been that good at math. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there are um, perhaps now, well, let me speak for myself. I personally am probably less afraid of the actual machine, but I'm afraid of the people who run the systems behind the machine. Or maybe I'm not afraid, I'm uh, uh, alert. Well, and maybe I, that, I should that ask. has to do with um, uh, what I would call, uh, you know, we have the Internet of Things nowadays. I just alluded to it. And perhaps this has to do with the Googleization of everything. The power mm -hmm. that the people who filter information for us or the systems or the algorithms that they have over how we perceive information and therefore how we perceive the world. Am I right to be alert? Well, if you put the question that way, how could I, how could I say no? Did, of course, go ahead, say no. No, of, co of course we should all be alert to all of these possible dangers. I'm interested that you're putting it in terms of that you're worried about the humans more than the machines. For example, in the case of Google, they would say, I'm pretty sure, um, that it's not humans making the decisions about what's important and what's not important on the internet. Quite the contrary, they put their faith in the algorithms. Mm -hmm. Letting humans decide would be cheating and it would open the door to all kinds of collusion with advertisers and things that they're accused of, I believe, so far falsely. I mean, I think the whole point of such enterprises as Google is to automate the process. Mm -hmm. Now, automating the process doesn't mean that a machine is doing the thinking. In a way, you could say it means that um, our collective intelligence is being harnessed algorithmically. Um, Google, as, as many people know, has a very ambitious project going on involving translation between languages. Mm -hmm. And it's really made uh, extraordinary progress. I was just saying to someone from Google that it's not very good from Dutch, uh, from English, no, from Dutch to English, but I'm told that it is very good for, the other way around, from English to Dutch. In general, it's very good. I remember even 10 years ago, people were saying that this is too hard a problem for artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's a really hard programming problem because every language involves so much knowledge of the real world. And the way Google does it, this is no secret, is by assembling statistics. They have so much information about what we say to one another, both typing and orally, that they're able to see statistical patterns about, about how phrases in one language connect to phrases in other languages. Isn't is, that just what I mean, though? The fact that they, uh, well, you're that they know so much and can harness so much, uh, uh, how can that not be manipulative? How could it not be scary? Um, we should be nervous. I mean, if you're asking me as a matter of public policy, what, how should a citizen behave about these things, then my answer is citizens should be alert and should ask their governments to keep a close eye on the large corporations that are such big players in cyberspace. Certainly Google chief among them, but also Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, now, I mentioned Wikipedia. Wikipedia is exceptional because it's not a corporation. It really is still a cooperative, cooperative effort. They've never made a penny, and maybe they never will make a penny. Still, shouldn't we be a little worried about Wikipedia? I and mean, there's an argument to be made. Uh, I wouldn't be the first to make it that Wikipedia, which, by the way, I think is just wonderful, in some ways involves a kind of dumbing down of knowledge. It's a kind of... Um, it's a potted version. A potted version. It's lowest common denominator. It's things that people can agree on. And sometimes the most interesting pockets of knowledge are coming from outliers and are not part of the consensus. But in the case of Wikipedia, we can't blame our corporate overlords. It's just something that's it's happening. Us. It's us. That's right. Yeah, Wikipedia, it's us. I was interested to read recently in, uh, in my own newspaper that uh, it turned out that 
uh, a huge percentage, 80, 90 percentage of the people who actually contribute to Wikipedia and make it what it is are men. And that women apparently don't get involved. Well, that's a different subject. Have, have you ever edited Wikipedia? <laughs> no, I never have. Ha, I was, ha, I how many people that have edited I... Wikipedia? That's quite a, that's a lot. I see a woman. <laughs> I wasn't counting by gender. Two. But I was, I'm, su- <laughs> another, I, I'm surprised that's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. More glory to them. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's a little bit seductive to start doing it. And, and it's a genuine contribution to the public good, the public storehouse of knowledge. Absolutely. Um, assuming you're not a vandal. <laughs> How many of you were vandals? Okay, I didn't think so. <laughs> I wanted to get back to something you mentioned in your talk just now, Jim, that uh, touches on this, although perhaps not, not directly. You were talking about images and the amazing proliferation of images and uh, how many billions of images, how many billions of videos did, does YouTube uh, circulate every day? What is, given our, the complete context of information in which we live and information technology, where does this obsession with registering everything come from? Maybe, maybe we humans are pack rats by nature. Maybe we just like to keep well, we certainly like to collect things. And since my basic belief Let is... Let me do a quick poll in between. How many people have read all the PDFs that they've downloaded onto their computer? Oh, what a great question. Wow. Brave soul. You've won something. I don't know what yet, but you've won something. I haven't. And it makes me realize, indeed, how, how we, want it, we want it all, and then we complain that we can't deal with it. Right. I, I, I certainly own books that I haven't read. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've paid money for books that I, that I haven't read. And um, I feel bad about that. <laughs> I mean, no, I really do. Two more questions before we open this up to the audience. Um, talking about dealing with this information overload that we all want and reject at the same time, uh, in your book, you say that uh, very simply there are um, two strategies for coping with this. Well, uh, I know what they are. Uh, filter and search. Searching we do ourselves, but filtering is something that, going back to the, the, the algorithms or the consensus model of Wikipedia. So the searching I understand, but what about the filtering? There's so much... And that seems to me an issue that you, that you don't really deal with towards the end of the book, the extent to which information and the filtering of information is an issue of power. Who has the power to decide on what information reaches us? That's very true. I remember long ago when I was still working at the New York Times, an editor there used to say in public you know, to, to people, um, that what you pay for when you buy the New York Times is not the news we print, it's the news we don't print. <laughs> In other words, and, and this was very true, the, the New York Times was making serious, carefully considered choices every day about what was important enough to put in the paper, and then within that, what was important enough to put on page one, and then within that, you know, the, the placement of every story on page one of the New York Times was very carefully considered. And at, at that time... How did they find the time to do this in a daily newspaper? Well, there was a meeting every afternoon in the um, executive editor's office, and the, the department heads would, would trundle in and pitch their stories. I mean, I think this is still... I know it's still true. It's, it's still no how they do it. Us. But what's happened is it doesn't matter as much anymore. I mean, as somebody who used to work for the New York Times, I'm a little bit saddened by this. I mean, there was a time when the decisions made by the editors of the New York Times were very important in the political life of the United States. Now, not so much. And the more people are reading the New York Times online, the less that page one distinction matters because stories are constantly moving in and out and up and down. Mm -hmm. And... um, And yet, as you say, there is still a function being exercised by institutions like that. Now, 
institutions like that covers a, a wide range now. It means traditional institutions um, like our newspapers, uh, by book publishers, um, by museum curators, all of these are members of a family. And then on the other hand, by newer institutions like Google, which as you say, has power, and which also is filtering. I mean, we think of Google's primary function as being search, but I would suggest that it's what, they, what they do is just as much about filtering. It's not just that they find the thing we want, it's that you search for something and they are not showing us the other million things or on the next 10 pages, which nobody looks at. That's right. And again, there is a question of power there, whether or not they're wielding it deliberately. Um, in our era, one thing that's happening that everybody knows is that this power has been decentralized. Everybody, every blogger can feel a certain amount of power. And at the same time, every blogger can feel, on a bad day, powerless, you know, posting their stuff and then not appearing high up in search engine rankings or not getting a lot of followers. It's, um, a, it's a very changeable situation. I believe that ultimately, and now, now we're getting into an area where I'm maybe speaking emotionally and not rationally. That's valid too. Okay. I tend to believe that as humans, we are going to be able to make smart decisions and we're going to be able to use the various new tools that cyberspace provides to do these things, to search and to filter. And so, uh, to some extent, power is in the hands of these authorities, traditional and new. But in other ways, I think we find ways to choose our own sources. If you're on Twitter, you're choosing people to follow, and those people even in their little 140 character messages, are the people you have decided are most likely to say things that are of interest to you in the course of a day. Um, that's an example of exercising power in the other direction, uh, of doing the searching and filter, of, of trying to take back control over the searching and the filtering. It's the it's the uh, a much used word, the democratization of information. Yeah. I find Twitter for me is an invaluable source, not only of putting myself out there, but also of documentation, of interesting articles, of images, of uh, what's going on in the world. I, I don't, I'm amazed that we're starting to be an advertisement for Twitter because it's still 140 characters. And yeah. you started by asking me about, you know, the. That's a lot more the than the chances <laughs> that the book will survive, and now we're ta we're 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 down to a medium, you know, itty bitty, itty bitty, bitty bitty as in bit. How can you say anything profound, and yet here we are, reluctantly or not, embracing it? Yeah, maybe it's not profound; it's just useful. Okay. What about the concerns that uh, we have now for our privacy, thanks to all this information and the technology? Well, that's your question, and now we could start over and have another I know, seven we could start another all two over. hours. Okay. Maybe we should do this one over drinks and uh, open this up to the floor. It's a, it's a huge question. It is I, a huge question. And actually, it's not a, it's not a question I, I deal with that much in the book, no, no. to be honest, but it's certainly something I care about. I'm, I mean, um, let me say, just say this one thing about it that may or may not be obvious, and that is privacy is not the same as secrecy. To be private does not necessarily mean withdrawing from participation in the exchange of information and hiding in a cave. What it ought to mean is uh, the ability to exert control over our own information. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure everybody thinks about the issue that way, and uh, things are so much in flux. You know, again, these powerful companies that, that you've mentioned have a lot of information not just collected from the world in general, but an information about us and our habits. I think any good definition of privacy is going to have to include uh, individuals maintaining control over that information. Yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of uh, uh, stink about the way Facebook uses our, uh, our information to get at our friends in rather devious fashion. Did you see the movie? Well, yes, I did. Yeah. And are you on Twitter? I'm Can I follow you? 
You can follow me, but uh, you're bound to be disappointed. <laughs> I really, I do not tweet very much. Do you tweet profoundly? I, I certainly don't tweet profoundly. <laughs> well, I'll give it a try, and then if I'm not interested, I'll unfollow. Yeah, it's ruthless, this information That's technology. It. And my feelings won't be hurt. Okay, just so you know. Up to you. <laughs> Sir. Jim, I have a question. One, actually, first I want to thank you for not being, or maybe you should become, a sesquipedalianist. That would Ob be very nice. Obs obsessed with what? A sesquipedalianist. A system analyst. Oh. A sesquipedalianist. That's someone who uses long words. I, the one thing that okay. I've... Okay, a self-referential joke. Yes, thank you. <laughs> the thing that, that really disturbs me about this evening is morals, ethics, empathy, love. That's what, four things. That's a lot. What is the purpose of the information? Oui. We are not entitled to know the answer to that question. That sounds like a biblical answer. If information has a purpose, and I don't know that it does. It is not revealed to us. Then we're lost. He's quoting scripture. No, I made that up. Oh. <laughs> In other words, you don't know? I don't. Oh, okay. okay. I don't know. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> First, the other gentleman, then uh, Mr. Noikon. Yeah, the, I, I was reminded by that remark of like information is more than data. Could you speak more closely to the microphone? It's hard to yes, hear. I can. Oh. No, that isn't the problem. You know, the problem is we're in a church and, a, and the sound echoes, so... I, I was reminded by the previous gentleman of, of the uh, progression, information is more than data, knowledge is more than information, wisdom is more than knowledge, and love is more than wisdom. Okay. But my question to you, Mr. Clegg, is the following. Um, I've been a, a reader of your books, um, Chaos, and now I'm going to read your book, The Information. And I, I'm seeing a build-up there, um, because you all already this evening almost touched upon the next theme for your next book, which is consciousness. I see you smiling. I'm smiling. Well, is that the end of the question? No. <laughs> no. The question is, what do you think about the proposition that information cannot be without context? What do I think about the proposition that information cannot be without context? Correct. If I understand what you mean by context... I think it's a surprisingly difficult proposition. Let me say this, let me see if I can explain what I mean. Um, a point about the pivotal work of Claude Shannon that I started by talking about, the information theory he created, was to think about information in the abstract, to think about information separated from any notion of meaning. Shannon took pains to say again and again that for an engineer, meaning was irrelevant. And so I think he would say that for his purposes, the context is not important. Now, maybe that's not quite what you mean, because in a different way, context does matter. Context provides, um, provides a kind of information that is... Uh, in ordinary human language, the problem of measuring information depends a lot on, its, on whether it is, in fact, meaningful or random. Um, if you have a, 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 a string of text 
and the word cow appears. It is statistically more probable that somewhere in the next thousand words, the word cow is also going to appear again. It's also statistically more probable that the word horse is going to appear. (laughs) So if you need to study the statistics of ordinary language, and computer scientists do need to do that, um, both meaning and context do matter. I hope I'm addressing the question you intended to ask. If I may uh, uh, answer, help answer your question with a quote from the book. Uh, in the epilogue, Jim writes, the birth of information theory came with its ruthless sacrifice of meaning, the very quality that gives information its value and its purpose. So, yes. Got it? Got it. <laughs> Easier question next time, please. I think please. Uh, Mr. Glick, I want to thank you very much for your nice presentation. I think you picked a wonderful topic for your new book. Thank you. And I would like to ask you to reflect on how the worldview that you sketch will or should or might affect the educational process in the future. I think we all recognize the notion that we are surrounded by a flood of information, not just available but also increasingly accessible. And so it's tempting to believe, and and many people perhaps do believe, that in the future education should focus much more on how to gain access than on how to control a large number of facts yourself. And at the same time, from all I know, so far the impact of information technology on education has been very disappointing. And in many ways it seems to me that the classical Socratic transfer of knowledge is still the most effective way to teach people. So do you believe that that is likely to remain the case? Or do you see major changes in the way in which we will transfer knowledge from, if you will, one generation to the next? I'm a big believer in teachers, in human teachers. Um, I certainly can't envision a world in which information technology in the classroom is replacing that, is replacing humans. Certainly, teachers in varying degrees, are are trying to figure out how to make effective use of information technologies. And um, kids in classrooms in varying numbers have, who show up carrying, you know, a laptop or a device, I guess it depends what level of education we're talking about. I mean, I'm not uh, in the field. It's been a while since I've been in in a school. But I'm well aware from people I talk to that... um, the opinions of teachers and professors on, on this question already varies widely. There are plenty of professors who are miserable when, uh, when their students pull out laptops during their classes. I've, I've heard professors say that they're banning laptops in the classroom. And um, on the other hand, it's easy to see students making incredibly valuable use of their computing skills in classroom settings and certainly back in, back in dorm rooms. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure you're also talking about education at a younger age. All I can say is I think there are tremendous opportunities from the technologies for, for educators and students just as for the rest of us, but there are also obvious dangers. I read an interesting piece around Christmas time in the New York Times by uh, one of the tech writers of the New York Times who took his iPad with him on vacation and wrote a fascinating piece, but also really very defensive about, yes, technology and electronics can be really good for family time, for educational goals about how they found fun excursions with the kids, how they determined the leaves on the trees, uh, all the wonderful things that you could do with the uh, consultation means that you had at hand. But I was so surprised by the defensive tone of this piece and that Apparently, there is an atmosphere of uh, uh, technology is only disrupting human contact and taking parents away from their children. Well, when I was growing up, the, the same problem existed, but it was television. I mean, nobody really wanted their kids spending a lot of time sitting in front of the television. I, I certainly believe that um, kids who are drawn away from the television to spend time at the computer terminal are making a change for the better, even if what they're doing at the computer terminal is not always to the liking of their parents. (laughs) Please. 
Um, my name is Beth Jackson. I'm an academic translator. I'd like to thank you very much for your talk. Um, you were talking a little bit about the, um, the filtering process in, uh, of Google and also of the possible dumbing down in Wikipedia. What interests me and what worries me a lot um, in my work, um, I, I spend most of the day on the internet, um, is the, the dichotomy between the information that is free and the information that we have to pay for. Uh, if, if you're translating a fairly obscure subject, you might often want to see what someone has written about it before. And the more obscure it gets, the more likely it is you're going to have to pay for that. And so I'd like to know what you think about the, uh, I think, pretty outrageous fees that academic publishers um, charge you if you want to um, consult an article, even if you just want to consult one page, one paragraph, one okay. sentence of, of a scholarly article that someone has, has written, um, unless you happen to have found it with your Google Book search and you just happen to get the bit that you want, you, it, it's often very expensive. And so that you're, you're steered towards the free information and away from the information that you need to pay for. And that, it's that dichotomy that worries me. I'd like to hear your... Okay, I, I'm going to give you an answer that you may not like. Except I'll start, by, I'll start by agreeing that in many cases, um, in many individual cases, traditional publishers, and it's especially true, I think, of scholarly journals, have not found a good model for charging users like me and apparently users like you. I, too, have been very frustrated by the difficulty, the expense of getting scholarly journal articles because I'm not affiliated with a university. And I know very well that my friends who are part of a university community in the U.S. get this stuff free because their universities are paying a, a site license fee. This might be getting into, this might be of narrow interest, what, what we're talking about. I think in the long run, it'll be better if academic publishers can find an economic, an economic model that allows people to pay a little bit instead of a lot. But I think generally the dichotomy between free stuff and stuff that costs money on the Internet is not a bad thing. What I think is actually dangerous is the very common view that on the Internet stuff ought to be free because after all it's weightless, it's insubstantial, it's transmitted practically without cost from place to place. You don't have to chop down trees, you don't have to have big printing presses, you don't have to have trucks, you don't have to pay for petrol, right? But you and I are, are in the business of producing information that we hope is worth paying for. And if it isn't worth paying for it, we're out of business. And so if um, researchers find that to get the stuff that's really useful to them, they have to pay instead of getting it for free, I think that's a good thing. But don't you think ju just as um, the fact I'm Sorry, that we have quite a few oh, more people. Uh, maybe, okay. So uh, could I ask you right. to give the microphone to the next person? Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for uh, writing such a wonderful book. It was the most... Um, inspiring thing that I've read in a long time, so thanks, thanks for you. that. Um, the question I was left with after reading it was um, what exactly information is. Like, um, in the beginning of the book, it starts as um, a human-made tool for communication, like with the African drums, up to the telegraph. Um, but then when Shannon starts to uh, write the human uh, genetic code on his list of powers of ten, it's, it becomes a concept to uh, uh, understand ourselves or the natural world around us. And then at the end of the book, uh, when you write about theoretical physics, it seems to become the most fundamental substance in the universe, maybe. So it's, it seems to uh, make this kind of shift in your book. And I was wondering what your uh, opinion is on it. So is it something that's an abstraction of uh, things we perceive, or is it something that's fundamental to our perception? The reason you're seeing different views of information in the book is, is exactly because I don't have the ability or I don't have the desire to try to give, I guess I don't have the ability to, <laughs> to try to give 
a simple answer to the question of what information is. It's not just one thing. It got a very precise scientific definition from Claude Shannon in 1948, and it's a definition that really works for engineers, and you can put it in words, but it's fundamentally a math mathematical thing. I mean, one bit of information is a choice. Um, in that definition of information, as I've said, um, the meaning of a message is not important. On the other hand, we're still human beings in this room, and this discussion has made it very clear that we care very much about the meaning of the information. And as someone said in a question, it, feel, it feels as though there's a sort of hierarchy from data to knowledge to wisdom to, was love the final yes. word? Well, I don't, I don't know about that. But um, <laughs> my answer is that that we have to have room for all of these views of information. The Oxford English Dictionary, previously mentioned, revised its definition just, I think, last December for the word information. It's in a constant state of flux now in its new cyberspace incarnation. And, and the definition runs more than 9,000 words, which is not quite as long as my book, but it's the length of a book. So if they can't do it, in any less, I don't feel embarrassed that I can't either. Thank you. Please. Um, the entry for the word set is supposed to be 86,000 words. But um, There you go. Uh, my question was, I'm personally interested in the relationship between um, Shannon entropy and von Neumann entropy, and I wondered if that came up in your researches. Well, you know that that question, even if I could give you a sensible answer, might not be of interest to the entire audience. <laughs> Let me say this in answer to the question. That I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to explain entropy in either sense in, in any detail here. It's true, as I've already mentioned, that Shannon created a kind of identity between his scientific conception of, of information and the uh, existing thermodynamic definition of entropy. And when he did that, it was rumored around Bell Labs that a conversation had taken place between Shannon and von Neumann, in which von Neumann had, had advised him to use the word entropy and had said, if you do that, no one will know what you mean and they will all respect you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yourself, and then you're the last. Oh, are you... Uh, yes? Okay. Um, last week, Joshua Four uh, held a lecture here in the Netherlands about um, his recently published book on memory, human memory and memory techniques. Are you familiar with the book? I, I'm, I've heard about it, but I haven't read it. Right. Um, well, in short, um, I, I hope you can still answer the question uh, could these techniques present a opportunity or perhaps even a solution to the flood uh, information management and perhaps uh, on an educational level? Yes. I think, that's an, I think that's an interesting question. And off the top of my head, I, I have to say that I don't think the answer is yes. I don't think... I can't imagine... But uh, I'm going to be tentative in saying that because... I don't want to tell people not to try it. Maybe that would turn out to be valuable to somebody. For me, the ability to memorize a lot of information isn't an answer to the problems created by the flood of information. The problem there is how to find what you want, how to sort out what's true from what's false, what's important from what's not important. It's also true and I think this is probably a point that Joshua Four has made, that um, with the advances in information technology, we've lost a lot of ability to memorize things that people used to have. I mean, certainly, before there was, before there was writing, the great oral poets could remember Homer's Odyssey, you know, all together, and... and there's no reason not to envy that. And even, I'm sure, 50 years ago, 
people in school memorized a lot more poetry than they do now. And I, I certainly feel on an emotional level that something has been lost if we don't have that ability anymore. But there it is. Personally, I don't feel the need to improve my memory capacity. And I'm aware that, that all of these technologies have enabled me to offload chores of memory to devices, to Wikipedia, to Google, to the Internet at large, just as I now offload most of my arithmetic to a machine. And your dishes. And I get some help with the dishes. And the dishwasher. Uh, and I don't mind that. I don't think that makes us any less human. No. Uh, so I think if you want to learn, um, if, if you want to improve your memory, I think that would be a good thing in its, for its own sake. Uh, but for me, it's not a solution to so the problem of information yep. flood. Yes, please. Yes. Um, am I understood clearly? Yes. yes. Um, you said in the discussion uh, with uh, Ms. Metz uh, that um, you believe that uh, uh, humans will be able to undertake rational decisions um, um, thanks to the widespread access to information. Um, but isn't it uh, uh, like uh, when uh, more we learn, the less we know? Isn't the widespread of uh, the widespread access of information preventing us from differentiating between the right and wrong information? I think both things. I don't want to. I don't want to give the impression that I believe that access, the, the fantastically enlarged access to information we have, to facts, has made us better decision makers, individually or collectively. Information is not the same as wisdom. And in many cases, it's true that um, that is for many people and for all of us at one time or another, just being able to gather more facts does not make us better citizens. It doesn't make us any smarter. It's a more difficult question whether on balance, access to information about faraway places, other times, and other people, um, access to conflicting points of view makes us better off, better equipped to make decisions. I guess on balance, I believe information's a good thing. Um, it just behooves us not to take for granted the idea, not, not to fall into the trap of, of putting it the way I may have sounded as though I was putting it at first, that we will automatically become better rational decision makers just because we have access to more information. I see. Thank you very so. much. If only it were so. Yeah, if only it were so. Our last question for this evening. Uh, I have a short question. You mentioned that... Uh, Can you that, speak? Oh, I am... Um, you, I have a short question. You mentioned that technology, as it is today, uh, doesn't make you feel less human. But if uh, in the future uh, artificial intelligence were to pass the Turing test, would that affect your feeling of humanity? Uh, it's, this is, that's a very fair question. Um, Big question. I, I, it's possible that I'm using the word human a little carelessly when I, when I say that. That's a kind of shorthand. And certainly we're already seeing words change their meanings because of the increasing ability of machines to do things. When we ask, can a machine think, the definition of think turns out to be slippery. And as I said, people used to think if a machine could play chess, it would be able to think. Now we know that machines can play chess and we don't consider that thinking we have maybe tightened our definition of what it means to think. In the same way, I think this is what you're getting at with the question, it's possible that our accommodation with machine technology will reach a point where we'll be very comfortable thinking of um, machines as partly human and vice versa. R2-D2. I'm not personally scared of that. I'm not, you know, 
I'm not going to be first in line to have the chip implanted in my brain, though. <laughs> but maybe you will have one of these uh, uh, Sony uh, uh, cute robot dogs. No, no, I didn't get in line for that either. No, they don't poop on the carpet. I prefer my actual dog. <laughs> Jim, this is seven years of work, pretty much full time. Will we see you back here in uh, 2018 or before? Okay. Promise? I'm happy to come back. Thank, thank you so much, Tracy. And thank, yes, and thank you all. Thank you, Tracy Metz. Uh, I would like to thank Basic Chabad Publishers for bringing uh, Jim Glick here. Also, I would like to thank uh, the, the Holland America Friendship Foundation, the U.S. Embassy in The Hague, Aegon, Walters Kluwer, Google, which I think was mentioned once or twice this evening, <laughs> McKinsey, Ahold, and uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, upcoming John Adams events, November 22nd, Van Gogh, The Life, December 15th, the novelist Jeffrey Eugenides. And in January, we have a course on Southern American fiction, which you can register for on our website. I would just like to say one final thing, uh, Jim. It, the, the book, the information, is about all of these things that have been discussed, information and, and being overwhelmed by it, and, and lots that wasn't discussed, like African drumming. There's a wonderful section about uh, the, the information that's conveyed in African drumming. Uh, one thing that was not mentioned, though, is... It, from sentence to sentence to paragraph to chapter, it's a thing of beauty, and the information is important, but uh, there's also the art. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you, thank so you all. Much.